and welcome to The Spectrum Show, the show dedicated to the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Coming up in this episode, we get all the Sinclair news and top-selling Spectrum games from July 1986. I get my hands on the Sinclair Vega. I review some older games, take a look at a newer title, Jeff provides another hidden gem. Jason continues his game development. And we take a look at some serious software. But first, the news. As mentioned last month, Amstrad are trying to block any move to allow companies to sell hardware based on the QL technology. However, the companies involved are not giving up. A new pressure group has been formed to keep the QL brand alive, while negotiations with Amstrad continue. Farm AMI are said to be interested in buying the complete rights to the machine, but Amstrad are remaining tight-lipped. As negotiations continue, rumours of substantial offers being made are circulating, but there are no further details. So it looks like the QL will have a life after Sinclair after all. Learning its lesson from its last debacle with spitting images, DeMarc has purchased the rights to create a game based on the popular board game Trivial Pursuits. The software house got into hot water last month when it was forced to change the name of its latest game, but it looks like they're doing things right this time. The game is to be launched in September across multiple platforms, including the Spectrum. As software houses start to look to Christmas, this is the time of year that they pick up programmers and start on their festive hits. However, this year there seems to be a lack of talent around, and the ones that are to be found are expecting far too much money, so say a lot of companies. Microgen claim some of their candidates are asking up to £28,000, when in reality the average for a programmer would be about fourteen. Other companies are also having trouble, including Palace Software, who offer £10,000 as a base salary, but applicants are expecting much more. Hopefully the Christmas market won't be affected by this, and Spectrum owners will get their fair share of games. Sir Clive's company, Animatic, set up to develop wafer-scale technology, claim they're in the final prototype phase and require backing of around £6 million to be able to continue and produce commercially ready goods. The technology is aimed directly between hard disk drives and semiconductors and has been one of Clive's projects for a long time. Clive himself though is keeping a low profile, being a non-executive director but no doubt providing a wealth of information and experience. Beyond Software are to release the first official Star Trek game across multiple platforms later this year. The software company has licensed the title and the team responsible for the game will be headed up by Mike Singleton, the author of Lords of Midnight. The title is said to be an arcade strategy game with speech and will be available on the Spectrum, Commodore, Amstrad and Atari ST. The company are already boasting that the game will be the most significant step in the evolution of computer games. And that was the news, and now on to the top selling games. High in the charts this month are Heavy on the Magic, a graphically brilliant arcade adventure from Gargoyle Games. Jack the Nipper, the naughty game from Gremlin. Ace, the arcade flight simulator from Cascade. Master of Magic, the arcade adventure from Mastertronic. And Bobby Bearing, the marble madness-like game from The Edge. And that was the news and top selling games from July 1986. The Sinclair Vega, for those who don't know, is a modern commercial take on the classic ZX Spectrum. The idea was to produce a small handheld device that you could connect up to your television and just play all of those memorable games from your childhood. It could also help introduce the Spectrum to a whole new range of fans. The project began on Kickstarter and was very quickly funded. Backers got the units from the first batch of 1000, and sadly I missed out on those, unlike some unscrupulous people who immediately put them on eBay for four times the price. At least when I got mine a few months later, I would actually use it and not try to turn a quick profit. So let's start with the packaging. The 80s Spectrum box is now iconic, and retro computers have gone to a lot of trouble to replicate the look and feel. 
Even the back contains information about how to set it up, just like the original. The manual that's included is short and concise, and talks you through many of the options. But let's get on to the Vega itself. It's quite small, measuring just 13.5 by 8.5 cm, and less than 2 cm deep. It is, as you can tell, styled like the original, but obviously has less buttons. On the left is a joypad, in the middle a reset button, and on the right are 8 control buttons, 4 large and 4 small. Styled like the rubber keys of the original, the four larger ones are used for selecting, firing and options 1 and 2. The smaller buttons are used for in-game options as well as SD card reading and mapped buttons for various games. On the back there's a slot for a micro SD card so you can load your own games, but the unit itself is shipped with what it claims to be a thousand classic games. A massive cable exits the back of the Vega, ending in a composite video, left and right audio, and a USB plug for power. Once plugged in, it starts up on its own, and after a logo and the option to see the first 1000 backers, we get to see a list of the games. You can move through these using the up and down on the joypad, or you can move through the alphabet using the left and right on the joypad. I must admit, some of the games are a bit obscure and some seem not to work with the joypad. I think this could confuse a younger generation. There are some old gems too from Arctic and DK Tronics, as well as some newer games from the last couple of years like Sun Bucket, El Stompo and Sergeant Helmet Zero. Pressing the select button will take you straight to the game, where you can usually begin playing by just pressing the fire or select button. The composite signal is okay, but on some games, for example Rex, the pixel roll was a bit bad. Maybe it was my TV, but it usually works fine on a real composite modded spectrum. Playing the games is as expected, just like the real thing. Although games requiring four directional movement, for example jetpack, take a bit of practice, unless you've got really large thumbs. During the game, you can press the M button, which will bring up the menu allowing you to save the game, load a previously saved game or exit back. Saving and loading requires an SD card, but more about that later. When viewing this menu, pressing the C button will bring up the control options. This acts as a virtual keyboard, but also as a control configuration. Be careful here, by mistake I changed this and the game I was playing stopped responding to the joypad until I had reset it back. The virtual keyboard is used when playing adventure games, Yes, there are quite a few adventure games loaded onto the Vega, and it isn't particularly suited to them. To type in commands you have to navigate the control menu. On the right is displayed what each of the eight buttons represent. This can be numbers, symbols or letters. And on the left is the option to change these representations using the joypad. A very long and time consuming process if you want to type out long sentences, and I doubt this will get used much. Once you're fed up of the 1000 games, you can load your own using a micro SD card. Simply copy the games you want onto it, or place it in folders to make life easier. Insert the card, power on, and press the B key. Now the manual says the A key, but that didn't work for me, I had to press B. You are then asked which folder you want to scan. Pressing the select button will scan that folder for any files the Vega can recognise. As a test I copied up a Z80 and a tap file of Antiquity Jones. Both were recognised and both worked, although I couldn't get the controls to work properly. This would need a bit of experimentation, because the game isn't Kempston compatible, something that the Vega uses. Strangely, I then copied more games to the card, re-scanned, but it only showed up the two previous ones. I tried this several times with Z80 and TAP files, and I even tried renaming the folder, and that didn't work either. Maybe it needs a firmware update. New firmware, when available, can be downloaded from the Retro Computer's website, placed on a micro SD card, and used to upgrade the unit. So what do I think of the Sinclair Vega? It's a nice little device that gives quick, easy access to playing Spectrum games without the hassle. It still needs a bit more work in my opinion, especially around game controls and key mapping. If they give you an option to load your own games, then they should equally allow you to modify the key mappings in an easy way. Maybe an XML file on the SD card would work, and it would certainly be much more easier than trying to use the limited buttons on the device. 
For straight plug and play gameplay, it's actually not bad. I quite enjoyed playing some of the old games using the modern joypad setup, and it actually improved some of the games for me. Picture quality can be a bit off, but then again so was the original, but the sound is very good. So if you want a quick way to play specy games without faffing about with real hardware or have no option to run emulations on your main television, then this is ideal. Could I recommend one though? Well yes and no. Yes if you want quick access to games as mentioned before, and no if you're a hardcore fan who loves to delve into emulation and real hardware, and for whom anything new should be buried in a deep pit and forgotten about. So it's up to you really. For me, I really enjoyed playing with this, and there's still a lot more games to try out. This is Dynamite Dan, released in 1985 by Mirasoft. Dynamite Dan was for me a standout game when it was released. Platform games since Manic Manor had been flooding the market and most of them were utter dross. However, when this came along, it changed my opinion of platformers, at least initially. The idea is that you have to collect 8 sticks of dynamite so you can blow up the safe and get your hands on the secret plans. This is made difficult by masses of enemies, and this is my first problem with the game. There are just too many of them. Making progress is difficult, sometimes impossible. Every screen is packed with things that you have to jump over, avoid and dodge. As you move around the game map, there are some brilliant bits of scenery and some marvellous sprites, all well drawn and animated. There's a little lift in the middle that takes you through all the different areas and also teleports. Scattered about there are other items that replenish your health or help in one way or another. At the bottom of the map there's water, which is deadly, but you can survive if you're carrying an oxygen tank. Other things to keep you on your toes are the bouncy platforms and electronic zappers. These make timing your jumps even more tricky. Sound wise the game is brilliant, with some nice effects and tunes for collecting different items. Collision is very strict, which makes the game tough. And for me, an average gamer, just that little bit too difficult to enjoy it. I found it hard to get anywhere and this spoiled for me what otherwise would be a great game. With the unlimited lives makes it better and doesn't really make the game any easier. It's just that you don't have to keep starting a game. You still have to make the jumps and avoid the water, not to mention navigating the map. Overall then, a great game if you are good at platformers, but be warned. It's not easy. River Rescue was released by Thorn EMI in 1984. With so many arcade clones about, companies had to be careful to avoid getting into trouble, and it looks like Thorn EMI's way of doing this was to change the orientation. This is, in essence, River Raid, spun around so that you move horizontally rather than vertically. It's also got aspects of scramble thrown in. There are a few other subtle differences too. First, you are driving a boat rather than a plane. And second, you have to rescue scientists lost in the jungle. Once you get into the game, the screen scrolls smoothly from right to left, and your boat is positioned in the river, already moving at a fair speed. The river is more or less straight, but then obstacles begin to appear. There are logs, small islands and crocodiles. Luckily though you have a gun and can shoot the logs and crocodiles. It's quite tricky to get far without crashing into something, and it's a test of reactions more than anything else. If you do manage to get far enough, you can then rescue a scientist for additional points. To do this you have to manoeuvre your boat alongside the top pier, still moving at speed so it is tricky, 
You then collect a scientist and carry on. You keep doing this until you have a few, and then you can drop them off at the next lower jetty. As the game progresses, things get harder, with bits of land sticking out, and even planes that drop mines on you. If you manage to rescue six scientists in one go, you get a chance of a larger bonus by guiding your boat in between two narrow blue rafts, which is very, very tricky. Then it's back to the river to carry on, with the speed cranked up even more. This game isn't bad, just a bit too difficult. Or is it me that's getting old? It would have been better to have a slower start and gradually get faster, rather than throwing you in right at the beginning with the fast pace. The graphics are pretty basic, with very little animation or definition, but I suppose they get the job done. Sound is not too bad, there's some decent effects, and the constant chugging of your boat engine doesn't get on your nerves as you think it would do. Overall then, not a bad game, for a quick pick up and play. Why not give it a try? Sylvania Spectral Interlude was released by Rewind in 2015. There won't be many games fans around that don't know the name Castlevania. It was a hugely successful game across multiple platforms. Well, apart from the Spectrum. Until now. Castlevania Spectral Interlude is a massively impressive game and features many role-playing elements along with the usual whip-cracking action from the original. The story builds as you progress, and is a little long to explain everything, but your day job is clearing skeletons from the graveyard, and as you go about your business, you meet a necromancer, who turns out that he wants you to kill him. Once dead, you pick up an artefact, and the story starts unfolding. He will help you bring back Dracula's castle into this world, so you can destroy it. So, off you go, in search of points of power, or at least parts of them, as some of them have been broken. The game is a flipped screen platformer that features some stunning backgrounds. Each type of area, from the graveyard to the caves, the town and the forest and beyond, all have their own music, which again is very impressive. As you wander about there are plenty of things to whip, not just skeletons, and these will give you money which can be used to buy better equipment. At various places there are statues that can be used to replenish your health, and you'll need them because this game is far from easy. Control is good, and even climbing stairs is made easy. The gameplay is spot on. It will take you a while to complete this game, but it's certainly worth it. As you bump into various people, you can enter into conversations with them, this slows the pace down, but suits the game really well, and helps to build an atmosphere. This game then is highly recommended. Go grab yourself a copy now. Hello and welcome to Hidden Gems. In this section we take a look at some games that aren't as well known but are still superb and well worth picking up and playing even today. And today's gem is a little known game called GB Limited. GB Limited, or Great Britain Limited, was written by Simon Hessel and originally released by him under the publisher Hessel Software. It was then re-released by Microgen in 1982. When I started researching this game, I was surprised to find that there was a remake made in 2006 for Windows. I've not played that remake, but if it is as good as the original, it'll be pretty entertaining. GB Limited is a strategy great 
game, much in the vein of Football Manager. So what you have to do, instead of running a football team, as you do in Football Manager, you need to run the country, Great Britain Limited. You start the game having just been newly elected, and over the course of several years, you have to adjust rates of tax, benefit rates, and spend money on various items, such as building new schools, jobs for school leavers, etc., which can bring you social reforms. Now, if you're a shoot 'em up fan and really love whizzing around a screen shooting aliens, then you probably won't like this game too much. However, if you like games such as the aforementioned Football Manager or A Rockstar at My Hamster, where you have to control certain parameters and try and run a business or run a football team, then you will like it. It's an interesting take on that kind of strategy genre, a genre that doesn't really exist anymore. So it's well worth going back to because there are no modern games being made of that type. And if you enjoy them, your only choice really is to go back and find a game such as this and try playing it. Now, of course, on this type of game on the Spectrum, the graphics aren't great. But if you're looking for a game with great graphics, then you're probably in the wrong place anyway. What makes this game so good, and actually what makes all of these kind of games so good, certainly it was true of Football Manager for me, is that it gives such a unique challenge. You have to think about what you're doing and adjust parameters and learn the game in a way that you'd learn, say, a platform game. But, of course, the skills that you need to learn are different. And there is a real challenge in this game in trying to be re-elected and one of the strange things you realize is all those things that politicians must be tempted to do when they're coming to the end of their term in government cutting taxes raising benefits to get their popularity up you start thinking of doing you start thinking i could just slash income tax and then i'll get re-elected and put it back up again now i'm not saying that politicians actually think like that and act like that but you are really really tempted to do it and of course, if you do do it, once you get re-elected, you land yourself with a huge big headache because that will come back and bite you. Key to the game seems to be getting inflation under control. But you can do that whichever way you want, by raising taxes, by lowering taxes, by making sure that you don't spend too much on benefits or reforms. The other key seems to be getting the deficit of payments under control so that you're not spending more than you're making. Which is interesting as well, because that actually seems seems like quite a modern take. I remember years and years and years ago, there was some American president whose slogan was, it's the economy, stupid. Well, let's face it, in this game, it is the economy. You're running the economy. I guess while you are playing the prime minister of the country, you're more akin to the chancellor. Unlike some of the games in this series, this isn't a seriously addictive game. This isn't a game that's going to take hours and hours of your time if you manage to get addicted to it. However, it's a great little game just for a bit of fun. Boot it up, have a go and see if you can get re-elected. And then if you do, see if you can get re-elected again. The most times I've managed to be re-elected is four times, but it gets seriously tough after that. It gets harder every time you get re-elected. If you've ever looked at the Prime Minister or the Chancellor of the Exchequer and thought to yourself, I can do a better job than them, then give this game a go. You might find it's a bit harder than you thought. So until next time, happy gaming! Welcome to the development diary of Jason Below, trying to create a Spectrum version of the arcade game Berserk. After reading more information about the arcade game on the internet, Jason discovered something that could cause him problems. Evil Otto, the blob that appears on screen if you stay on the level too long, moves at the same speed as the player, but twice as fast as the robots. Because the game is currently written in BASIC, this could cause problems, because to fix it, would mean making the player and Otto move in two character jumps, which would look pretty terrible. Another solution, and one that Jason selected, was to change the movement of the main player. Instead of moving in 8 pixel jumps, it would make him move in 4 pixel jumps or half character blocks, but he would have to make sure that he always ended on a full character square. To do this, he changed the animation so that the player used two character blocks for the transaction. An advantage to using this method meant that it also fixed an issue with firing, because that too had to move faster than the player and the robots. The downside would mean no diagonal movement or firing though. The next problem was speech, 
the arcade game had this, so how could this work on the Spectrum? The easiest option would be to use the Kura speech unit. The only problem was, when he enabled this in the emulator, it reset, losing his saved code. So, a neat trick he found was to enable Interface 1 in the microdrive, save the game to the MDR file, enable the speech, which reset the machine, but he could still load the game back from the MDR file, so he could carry on. As more code was added, the game began to slow down though, which is typical for a basic game, and this was before any robots had been added. More work needed here then, or maybe even consider machine code. Forging ahead and Jason added a firing routine, but this again slowed the game down. Find out what happens next month. A few games for the Spectrum included speech, some better than others, for example ETX from Abex, Meteor Storm from Quicksilver. If you wanted to use sampled speech, then one of the ways to do it was to buy a program that allowed you to record audio into your Spectrum so it could be digitised and played back. Now the Spectrum had very limited sound capabilities, so Quicksilver were brave when they released EasySpeak. For such a program, you'd have thought there'd have been instructions, but the inlay just tells you how to load it. It's a small program though, just 5k. Once loaded, you get a menu that includes instructions, which goes into detail about how to get the best sound, how to save it, and how to play it back. You can set the start address and length of the sample, record it, and play it. So let's jump straight in and capture something. Once connected up, I put a tape in the cassette player that had been primed with some audio from the show. Hit record, and press play, and waited. After a few seconds, it should tell you that it's finished but no matter what I tried to do in this instance, I couldn't get it to work properly. So using emulation, I managed to fluke it using Spectaculator's real audio function. Going back to the original, I did have it working at some point, but managed just to capture a load of static with some rambling, vaguely familiar sounds in the background. I kept trying with different volume levels and it seemed to me that the program kept recording the audio, or whatever it was, over the top of the previous sample, so it just got mixed up. To get round this you had to break into the program and reload it. And doing this confirmed that indeed this is what was happening, because each time I ran the program, with the right volume, I got a half decent scrambly sound. The it took a while to get anything that was half decent, but even then it was like listening to a slightly drunk version of myself that had been slowed down and was speaking underwater. Music proved terrible, there was just too much for the little spectrum to handle. But just a plain voice fared a little bit better. To get it to play back on my Spectrum, I had to do a bit of mixing and matching, so I recorded the audio on an emulator, put it back onto my smart card, wrote a small program to load it, and then played it back, just so that you could see the effect. So, if you want to get some crackly, slowed down speech in your game, this is a quick way to do it. But I suppose it's just a bit of fun at the end of the day, and I can't really see any commercial use for it. Well, that's the end of this episode. I hope you enjoyed it, and thanks for watching. You can get in touch by using the details on screen. See you soon.